Over the past year, I've posted many videos explaining why I'm very bullish on real estate investment trusts at the moment. In short, they are today priced at their lowest valuation since the great financial crisis and that's despite enjoying steady growth in their cash flows and their dividends. What happened, in my opinion, is that the market overreacted to the surge in interest rates, not understanding that trade balance sheets are today the strongest they've ever been. And as a result, the positive impact of inflation on rents was actually greater than the negative impact of rising interest rates on the interest expense of most rates. This explains why rate cash flows kept on rising in 2022, 2023, and so far in 2024, even despite the surge in interest rates and their share prices crashing down to much lower levels. Historically, it's always been a great idea to accumulate rates after such a crash, and I don't think that this time will be any different. In fact, we today already start to see the light at the end of the tunnel with the Fed being expected to cut interest rates already in the near term. And I think that this is going to change the market narrative and lead to an epic recovery in the REIT sector. But that does not mean that every REIT is worth buying. There are over a thousand REITs worldwide. They invest in over 20 different property sectors, 30 plus countries. And while some are great buying opportunities, others are real landmines that could lead to significant investment losses. Hey everyone, this is Jules. I run a small investment firm that specializes in REIT investing. In today's video, I'm going to talk to you about my five least favorite property sectors to invest today. But before I get into it, I want to remind you that we just recently launched a new YouTube channel that will discuss our favorite non-REIT investment opportunities so there will cover many other high yielding sectors like MLPs, BDCs, CEFs, uh, ETFs as well and many other high yielding vehicles. It's run by Samuel Smith who's VP at our investment firm. I highly recommend you go check it out. We just recently discussed there some of my favorite non-REIT investments for 2024 and 2025. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. So the first property sector that I'm avoiding for the most part today is self-storage. These REITs like public storage, extra space storage, life storage, uh, national storage affiliates have been highly rewarding over the past decades. In fact, this was the most rewarding property sector of all, generating nearly 20% annual total returns over the past 30 years. But I'm sure you've heard the saying that past results are not indicative of future performance and I think that applies really well in this specific case these REITs were so exceptionally rewarding over the past decades because the concept of cell storage was rapidly growing in popularity but there was relatively little supply so it offered many new development opportunities to these REITs and in many cases they were able to develop new properties at very high initial yields of nearly 10% resulting in very large and unusually large spreads over the cost of capital. Moreover, this is one of those property sectors in which scale is a major advantage because it then allows you to build a brand, have major economic of scale you can do national advertising campaigns and and other things uh, implement uh, highly sophisticated revenue optimization models and so these REITs were also able to buy out uh, self-storage properties from small mom and pop operators change their brand improve the marketing include them in national advertising campaigns and so on and create a lot of value in the process but these high returns then attracted a lot of new competitors now the secret is out and a lot of new supply has been built over the years especially following the pandemic because this was a strong tailwind for the industry when you think of it because a lot of people were moving around a lot of people bought a new new toys for the outdoors like rvs jet skis and so on uh, many people needed to make space for a home office and some older generation unfortunately also passed behind and left a lot of stuff um, and so there was a boom in demand during the pandemic and this then led to a boom in supply as well and unfortunately now this new supply is gradually hitting the market even as the demand is normalizing in the post-covid world people are gradually returning back to the office they are selling some of their toys that they might have bought during the pandemic because now they can travel and do other things as well uh, the vaccine is helping reduce the death related to COVID-19. And so demand is going down even as new supply is going up. And unfortunately, it's leading now to declining occupancy rates for most American cell storage REITs. It's also reducing the rent levels of many in many markets. Uh, it's also increasing the leasing incentives that are required uh, from these companies. And so generally speaking, the outlook is quite negative for, for 2024, 2025. I think that things are going to get better perhaps in 2026 as demand and supply finds balance again. But if you look at the valuations of these REITs like extra space storage and public storage, they really aren't that low relative to other property sectors, which are even stronger in my opinion. 
For this reason, I have no interest in self-storage REITs in the US today. However, there are some opportunities in some foreign markets. I, I, we own a self-storage REIT in the UK, one in Canada, and one in Australia. If you want to access our entire international REIT money portfolio, you can join High Yield Landlord, which is my REIT newsletter for two-week free trial. I'll put a link in the description of this video. Then the second property sector that I'm avoiding today is that of hotels and resorts. This has actually been the least rewarding of all property sectors over the past 30 years. And this is because it's a property sector that requires a lot of capex. You always need to keep your property in pristine conditions to attract the consumers. It's highly competitive. The barriers to entry are relatively small. You have growing competition from Airbnb, but also from third-party booking websites uh, like uh, TripAdvisor or Booking.com. And so they are eating a chunk of the profit and this chunk is ever growing unfortunately it's also a highly cyclical sector if you go into a recession typically your profits go down significantly as people start to travel less finally they also have the headwing of um, people now also traveling less for business because following the pandemic people learn to use video conferencing technology like zoom more efficiently and so and so people are now less likely to travel just for a meeting. Instead, they are more likely to just book a Zoom call. The valuations of most hotel rates are reflective of these issues. However, I still don't think that the valuations are low enough relative to other stronger sectors and therefore I have no interest in owning these rates. However, if I was going to invest in this property sector, I would probably stick with the leader host hotel, ticker symbol HST, uh, because it has a very strong balance sheet and it's well positioned to buy out properties from distressed operators at attractive valuations if and when we hit the next recession. Hey, sorry to interrupt you for a second, but could you please click the like button, subscribe to the channel that will help me a lot to keep on growing. Thanks so much in advance. Then the third REIT sector that I'm completely avoiding is that of mortgage REITs or also known as M REITs. Uh, these REITs have actually done even worse than hotels over the past 20 years. They only managed to generate roughly 2% average annual total returns. And that's despite offering these very high dividend yields in many cases. Uh, popular examples here include Orber Realty, Anali Capital Management, AGNC, Investment Corp, and there are many others. And some, to be clear, there are exceptions. Some of them has done, have done relatively well over time. Orber Realty is a good example of that. Uh, Ladder Capital, Starwood Property Trust are, are good examples. However, it's, it's just not a property sector that I like because these REITs tend to be highly dependent on macro factors that are out of their control. So these are things like the level of interest rates, the direction, the spreads between long and short term rates and, and other similar macro factors that are completely out of their control and also very difficult to predict. And so I don't like to invest in businesses where you're so out of control uh, their destiny is really highly dependent on simply what the fed is going to do next and i don't like to be in this position and therefore i tend to avoid these reads they also quite often are externally managed which leads to conflicts of interest they are also heavily leveraged in many cases um, and so i think that there are better opportunities in other property sectors then the fourth property sector that I'm avoiding is that of data centers. Today, there's a lot of hype around these REITs like Digital Realty, Iron Mountain, Equinix. And that's because the trend of AI is leading to a lot of new demand for data centers. Um, artificial intelligence is almost certainly going to be a strong long-term tailwind for the sector. But the problem here is that the valuations of these REITs are already reflective of that. And so you, you're paying pretty high multiples relative to other property sectors. And then another fear that I have, not being a technology expert, is that some of these properties could become obsolete over the coming decades. And so if that's the case, and now we, we account for depreciation as a real expense, then in that case, these rates will be grossly overvalued. And there has been some legendary short sellers making this case now for a few years. And I've uh, dug into their research and it seems quite uh, credible to me. And again, I'm not an expert in technology. And so the risk to reward is relatively poor for someone with my expertise. And so I tend to stay away from these rates. And then the fifth and final property sector that I'm avoiding is probably not a surprise to many of you. It's that of office rates. But there are actually quite many value investors who are today piling up into office rates because they think that the, the, the pain that they suffered in recent years was just temporary. They think that remote work was 
overhyped and that people will now gradually return to the office and this will lead to a recovery in rents, occupancy rates and eventually valuations of office rates. But I don't really buy into that. Yes, I agree that not everyone is going to be remote forever. I think that people will still go to the office and, and these properties hold a lot of value. But I do think that we are going to be permanently moving into a hybrid work setting and this requires less office space. And so there is a long-term headwind that will impact uh, these office landlords. It will lead to lower occupancy rates, lower rents, uh, growing tenant improvements needs, higher capex also to adapt many of these properties into the changing needs of tenants. And once you take into ad- account all of these additional expenses, I actually think that many of these REITs are quite expensive. Uh, good examples that a lot of value investors today are buying are Boston Properties, SL Group, uh, Vornado, Empire State Realty Trust, which is the owner of the Empire State Building in New York City. Um, these are This is high quality office space. It's class A properties, but I think that even those will suffer over time because yes, they are not as heavily impacted as the older class B properties. But what you need to keep in mind here is that over the next years, as more and more leases expire and their debt comes to maturity, I think that many of the class B properties will change hands as a uh, Property owners default on their loans and new investors acquire them with a low basis, heavily reinvest in the properties to make them more competitive with class A properties. And so the competition will remain there. And this is going to weigh down the results of these rates that even own the trophy class A properties. And well, again, if you adjust their cash flow for the capex and tenant improvements that they will require in the coming years to, 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 to maintain their current occupancy levels, I think that these rates really aren't that cheap. Instead of investing in these five property sectors, I think that there's much better opportunities today in apartment rates, manufactured housing rates, um, industrial rates. That's one sector in which we are heavily investing at the moment with rates like First Industrial and Rexford Realty Trust. Uh, what else? Net lease rates, obviously, we heavily investing. Farmland rates. And there are many other property sectors, but My point here is that the REIT sector is vast and versatile. There's over 20 different property sectors. And just because I'm bullish on REITs does not mean that I'm bullish on every type of REITs. In fact, there's many categories such as the ones I discussed in this video that I'm not bullish on and I would rather avoid. Finally, if you want to access my entire Real Money REIT portfolio, you can join High Yield Landlord, which is my REIT newsletter for a two-week free trial. You won't be charged anything in the first 14 days. And if you decide to stick with us for the long run and follow our REIT investment strategy, you will also get a $100 discount for the 4th of July for the first year of your subscription. Finally, if you could please click the like button and subscribe to the channel, that will help me a lot. And if you have any questions, let me know in the comment section below. Thank you so much and see you at my next one. Bye-bye.